The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. The 7400 series digital logic chips have been around for forever. These ICs are the fundamental building blocks for digital circuits. Back in the 1980s, entire computers were built out of them. Today, they get used for learning about digital or as glue logic, which connects pieces of a circuit together. Because there are so many of them, it is difficult for me to give you a suggested list of essential parts. However, we can talk about how many different families there are for these chips. For example, these are all 7404s or inverters, but each one is a different logic family. So instead of talking about which NAND gates or shift registers you should have in your kit, let's talk about those logic families. Using a function generator and my scope, which in this case is the same box, we'll take a look at the performance differences of LS, HC, and HCT to understand when you should use each of them. Just a quick warning, there are a ton of measurements later, so check below for an index to them all. With that, let's go measure. If you are completely new to 7400 series or digital logic chips, Karen has several episodes of the learning circuit which introduce them. She even did a project where she builds a gate with discrete transistors. There are links to those videos in the show notes on the Element 14 community, which you can find your way to with the link down below. In this video, I am only showing a 7404 circuit, which is an inverter. That means the output is the opposite of the input. These chips can fundamentally be built with BJTs or MOSFETs. And then from there, there are variations that address capabilities like speed or low power. For example, today LS or low power shock key is popular for bipolar circuits. And for CMOS, you'll see HC or HCT. HC is high speed CMOS, while the T means it is TTL compatible. Fast forward to today, it is very rare that anyone uses the bipolar or TTL or LS family of chips. In fact, when you can find them, they're almost always more expensive compared to CMOS. Which you might say then, well, just use the CMOS chip and be done with it. And I would ask, well, which CMOS chip are you going to use? And then you're going to ask, well, how do I know which one to use? And then I'm going to answer, oh, you should check out this video I made for Workbench Wednesdays. Wait a minute. For the most part, here is my measurement setup. I'm using a 7404 chip or inverter for all of these measurements. For test equipment, I am connecting my oscilloscope's built-in function generator to the input of the gate and then the scope probes to the input and the output. Over on the oscilloscope screen, the yellow trace is always the input and the output is orange. Since this is an inverter, you can see that whenever the yellow is high, the orange is low. Quick side note, the HC chip that I'm using is in a surface mount SOT package. That's because it is a single gate, while the dip style packages all have six gates in them. Even though I already said it once, I feel like I should say it again. Let's go measure. A key characteristic for a logic family is its input threshold doubles. Texas Instruments has an excellent application note with a page that looks like this exactly like this. For these measurements, we only care about the 5 volt TTL and CMOS charts. These show the threshold, minimum input voltage, and output voltage levels for a higher low. Input voltages in this area are going to cause the chip to be unstable, while anything in these areas should have a stable output. To measure these input thresholds, I set up the function generator a little bit funny. I set the DC offset to the threshold voltage. Then, as I increase the amplitude, we can monitor what happens to the inverter's output. The LS started working right around 2 volts, which is its minimum input threshold. But notice how as the input voltage reaches 2.4 volts, the output is going up as well. More on that in just a minute. The HCT, which has the same input levels as the LS, was very interesting. With only 20 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak input, the gates started working. I mean, it looks terrible and there's a ton of jitter, but at least it's trying. And around 200 millivolts, the output actually looked pretty good. To me, the funny thing is, the scope doesn't even see enough amplitude yet to measure that signal, yet the gate is working. 
Unlike the LS, once we got into the proper input range, the output voltage did not change. Now for the HC chip, I did have to change the threshold voltage because it's different from the other two. And unlike the HCT, below 200 millivolts, it didn't even try. However, after 200 millivolts, it performed like the HC, as you might expect. So on the upside, the CMOS chips responded to very small signals, which can actually mean they're a little bit more sensitive to noise. However, what I really want to talk about next is the output performance of that LS chip, which I sort of glossed over until now. Too long didn't watch. TTL or LS chips do not output 5 volts. Seriously, let's go look at the scope where I have a few measurements. I've turned on a peak to peak and an amplitude for both the input and output signals. Peak to peak measures from the very top to the very bottom of the waveform to see the total swing, while amplitude is only looking at the top level compared to the base level. It takes into account the entire cycle, which is what we mostly care about in this measurement. Notice that the output amplitude is only 3.5 volts, which is dangerously close to the CMOS threshold level. So even though we think about 5 volts and TTL being synonymous, the LS family doesn't even output 5 volts. You can, however, use a pull-up resistor to help pull the output up the rest of the way to 5 volts, which is what I've got set up in my breadboard just for this case. On the scope, now we're getting a full voltage swing on the output, and while we're here, notice how the LS has a different rise and fall time. It's much cleaner on the rise, while very noisy on the fall, which probably has something to do with how they're constructed. Okay, so the whole reason HCT exists is because its input is designed to handle the lower voltages of the TTL family. Now that we understand that difference, let's go take a look at some other characteristics of these three family types. For measuring frequency, I'm just going to crank up the function generator until the chip stops working. To save a little bit of time, here are all three families compared to each other at one megahertz with really nothing special to show. And then here they are at 10 megahertz, which is the fastest square wave my generator can output. And again, there's nothing too special. So I'm going to switch to sine waves so that we can go to higher frequency. Looking at the LS, it made it to about 15 megahertz, while the HC got all the way to 22 megahertz, and the HCT died around 20 megahertz. Keep in mind, a sine wave is a slow edge, and so part of these results are just how the chips are responding to that slow edge, but it does give us some interesting comparisons. For example, the LS had decreasing output as frequency went up, versus the HCT, which was doing well, and then it just stopped working. What I think this test really does show is that even though these are digital ICs, they all perform different in terms of analog performance. Now, it is important to consider what frequency you need in a circuit's design, but what can be even more important is the rise and fall times that come out of that chip. And for this measurement, I'm placing the waveforms on top of each other and then zooming in. I've turned on a rise time measurement for channel one or the input, and a fall time for channel 3, or the output. Starting with the LS, notice that the input rise time is about 4 nanoseconds and the output is also 4 nanoseconds. Also notice that the output bounces around a little bit, which I mentioned in the last segment. The HC has the same input rise time, obviously it's the same source, but the output fall time is only 2 nanoseconds, that is 2 times faster than the LS. And then last is the HCT, which also had about a 2 nanosecond fall time. The output stage of the HCT is probably the same as the HC, so no surprise there. As just raw numbers, you might think that a 2 nanosecond difference doesn't matter. And you know what, in many cases maybe it doesn't. But the thing to remember is that CMOS chips have a faster edge rate than TTL, and fast edge rates can create noise in a system, which if we're designing something new, we can account for. But if you're trying to replace a TTL chip with a CMOS chip, that might be something that you have to check. For this last test, I'm comparing the propagation delay through the chip itself. How long does it take for the output to change? Which for an inverter is pretty fast usually. To make these measurements, I'm using the cursors to estimate the delay from the input to the output. I place one cursor at the start of the transition from low to high on the input, and from high to low on the output. 
This isn't the exact way you would measure propagation delay, but it is easier to compare because of differences in rise time and thresholds. The reality is they were all pretty similar. Looking at them all together, they all measured right around five nanoseconds. The CMOS did seem slightly faster, but it's hard to say. Of all the tests that I performed, this one surprised me the least. Now, if we had used older, slower TTL technology and compared that to CMOS, then we might've seen a difference. And whether you're designing a new circuit or trying to make a replacement, as long as the propagation delay is less than whatever you need, you're probably going to be fine. Okay, so now that we've looked at these five measurements, what can I say about picking 7400 series logic families? In general, get the HC or high-speed CMOS. They're fast, low power, still available, and relatively cheap. HCT should only be used in circuits with TTL chips. So maybe if you're like repairing something from the 1980s, they aren't as readily available as HC, but they could be easier to find than an LS. And frankly, the only time I recommend using an LS family is when you're replacing it in a circuit or you just wanna make some measurements with it. Modern CMOS devices are better in almost every respect. Now you might argue that TTL is more ESD resistant, and if you're using vintage parts, that's totally true. But if you're using a modern CMOS part, they're pretty well protected these days. So yeah. Remember that over on the Element 14 community, you can find show notes for this episode, which includes links to some application notes and links to the chips I used, like that single gate inverter. I also threw in a link to some SOT and SOIC adapter boards that I found that I really like. As always, that is the best place to ask me questions because I'm more likely to see them and answer them. I wanna say thank you for watching, but for now, it is time for me to get back to getting triggered on my electronics workbench.